Good morning. My name is Jonathan Edwards. I'm a partner in the investigation team here at Harrison Clark Rickabies. Thank you all so much for uh, joining our session this morning, where we will be looking at the stresses and strains of a health and safety investigation. Those of you that have been involved in these sort of investigations will fully appreciate just how difficult and stressful they can be to navigate. There's no question that over the last 18 months or so, health and safety has featured highly on the business agenda. Even before the pandemic, we saw an ever increasing burden on business to put in place measures and then monitor those measure, measures to meet regulatory demand and ensure compliance. The pandemic significantly added to those pressures. Juggling the additional demands imposed by uh, the pandemic with existing compliance requirements has been nothing short of a challenge, to say the least. In fairness, the Health and Safety Executive has worked constructively with business to bring about compliance rather than to issue an enforcement notice every time instances of breach have been identified. And this is very much in line with government guidelines. Nevertheless, it's really important to appreciate that the threats are there, they're very real, spot checks are continuing, and as I'm sure you know, a health and safety officer can come onto your premises, be it an office or a site, at any time to monitor compliance. I've been looking at some recent stats issued by the Health and Safety Executive, which really do emphasize why this is all so very important. The first one, 95%. Well, that's the success rate that the HSE has in bringing prosecutions. 95% of all prosecutions are successful. I'll come to the reasons for that a little bit later. 7,000. 7,000 is the number of enforcement notices that were issued, 5,000 improvement notices, 2,000 prohibition notices in the last year alone. 13,300, a very significant figure, is the number of inspections that were carried out by the Health and Safety Executive, again, over the last year. 32,000, well, that's the number of concerns that the HSE received about workplace activity. And then we come on to some very large numbers, the first being 38.8 million. That is the number of working days that were lost as a result of workplace absences through injury. And the largest figure, 16.2 billion, that is the cost to business of health and safety at work accidents. 1.6 million is the number of people who have suffered injury. 65.5 thousand is the number of riddle reports. You, you will be aware that in the event of an accident or in some cases a near miss, the duty holder has, is required to file a riddle with the health and safety executive explaining exactly what happened, the circumstances, and then the health and safety executive will make a decision as to whether or not it needs to investigate further. 65,000 of those were filed in the last year. And finally, 693,000, well, that's the number, it's an approximate number of people who sustained an injury at work last year. I'm joined today by Eric Peary. Eric is a consultant with Capita Real Estate and Infrastructure, 
and was for 29 years a senior inspector with the Health and Safety Executive. We're also joined today by my colleague, Kamal Chohan, who is also a partner in the regulatory team. Kamal is going to be addressing uh, points that are important to a duty holder's legal team when facing an investigation or a prosecution. So without further ado, I will hand over to Eric and hope you find this session really useful. Great, thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, introduction. Um, I, what I want to talk a little bit about today is hazard risk and enforcement. My name is Eric Perry. Um, I currently work with Capita as one of their health and safety experts. I've got 29 years experience in HSE and uh, retired in 2019. But for my sins, I've been reappointed as an inspector just recently to cover the COVID emergency. So in many respects, I've got a quite wide experience over a range of different uh, subject matters. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, what I'd like to talk about is um, the basis of health and safety law enforcement. Um, the key risk, the key point here is that unacceptable risks drives HSE prosecutions and all other forms of enforcement action and things like notices and so on. And to understand what acceptable means, you need to make the call on what is unacceptable. The key there is the risk gap. So what is acceptable and what is unacceptable? And the aim of this session, hopefully, is to understand how risk arising from work, remember it's always tied into work, is regulated. Got a rich history. Um, it goes right the way back to Cicero back in the Roman times, quoted as saying, the safety of the people shall be the highest law. And in some senses, we're just taking that down the next step. The legal driver, um, the lawyers will know more than me about this, but um, the key phrase that we always use is so far as is reasonable practicable. And what that means is you put the quantum of risk in one hand and then you put the cost in terms of money, time and effort in the other. Increasingly, you'll find things like environmental considerations put into to the, the mix as well. But for the purposes of this cost, we're really just looking at time, money and effort. But what is risk? what makes it acceptable. You do obviously accept some risk and you do so every day. Just take your last journey to work. Was it worth the risk? Did any of you choose the bus because it was 10 times safer than the car? Somehow I doubt it. But let's be a little bit more clear on what hazard and risk actually means. Hazard is the potential for harm arising from the intrinsic property of something to cause harm. Risk, on the other side, on the other hand, is the chance that that harm occurs. Probably easily illustrated <clears throat> by the fact that you could have a balloon full of cyanide gas and a cylinder full of exactly the same quantity of cyanide gas. The chances of the cyanide gas coming out of the cylinder are negligible, whereas the size, the, the, the chance that the gas will come out of the balloon is significant. So for the same hazard, you've got completely different risk. We don't actually talk about tolerable risk in the health and safety executive. What we actually talk about is a tolerable risk. And that is a, a willingness by society to live with a risk so as to secure certain benefits and the confidence that the risk has been properly controlled. The bus journey, just think of it. You want the driver to be properly trained. You want him to be health checked and you want the bus to be pro properly maintained and tested. So yes, you do accept these risks, but only if you know they've been properly controlled. Types of risk, well, there are two broad types. Individual, that's just the sort of thing you see people in work sites facing, but they may have a fall hazard or there may be a risk associated with some chemicals. Or wider societal concerns where you've got matters such as number of fatalities happening at a single time or a particularly large scale incident that disrupts a whole load of other people. So we, we'll look at both of these as we go through the presentation. But first, what I would like to look at is basic enforcement principles that the health and safety executives use. Um, they're very straightforward, actually. Proportionality, the absolute size of the risk. We're not going to look at trivial matters. It's not going to happen. It's just a matter of trying to make sure that you've got the grasp of what the size of the risk is. It comes back to the risk gap. We also tend to target appropriately and we use various techniques to do that. So, for example, we really do focus on higher risk activities. Sometimes we look at high hazard activities as well, but we'll maybe talk a little bit about that later. We also aim to be consistent 
we don't look for uniformity. It's just it's impossible given the number of different industrial situations you can come across. But a similar circumstance is key to the idea of consistency. We also like to be transparent. We need to provide clarity for duty holders. They need to know what we expect them to do. And last but not least, of course, we need to be accountable. And we are a pretty open uh, organisation and it's very easy to make complaints about various bits and pieces. There's always a tendency, I should say, to focus on occupational accident risk. One of the key things is when you're considering this is to consider ill health. Ill health is a much bigger problem and it's far more difficult to evaluate. Let's just take one, let's take a quick look at asbestos disease. You've got basically three or four different types of illnesses arising from asbestos exposure. So 2011, we had 429 deaths from asbestosis. We had 2,000 estimated asbestos related lung cancer deaths. We had a further 2,291 deaths from mesothelioma again in 2011. If you put that against the road traffic fatalities for 2012, you'll see that there's only 1,754. Just think about that. You're looking at twice, sorry, three times the amount of fatalities from a single industrial disease. And the sad thing is that this exposure is still occurring despite detailed knowledge of the hazards and indeed quite a, a lot of HSE input into the problem. Have a look at this. Um, it's a fuse carrier. It's an old fuse carrier. And you can see the, the, the two on the left hand side of the picture are empty. You can see that there's a white material in the, the right hand four. If you look carefully at the, the surface in which the fuse carrier is actually lo located on, you can see the asbestos lying on the surface. Somebody has cleared them out. Somebody has done it whilst it's dry. It's highly likely that they've been healed or been exposed to asbestos. Refurbishment work, that's where most people are getting the exposure now. It's people like plumbers, it's people like electricians. And you can see a bathtub with a big, huge piece of board on it, and it's got AIB written on it. That's asbestos insulation board. Somebody's cut that out. You can see stuff lying all around the place. It seems highly likely that that will include asbestos. Now, we talked earlier on a little bit about societal risks, and I want to just expand a little bit on that. <laughs> societal risk is effectively is hazards that impact upon society. They may have repercussions on government. They may provoke a socio-political response. And the risk um, of events causing widespread or large-scale detriment. There are frequently low probability and high consequence events. And in these cases, we tend to look more at the hazard. As an example of that, I would just point to the recent Beirut disaster where uh, 3,000 tonnes of ammonium nitrate, equivalent to about 1,000 tonnes of TNT, detonated, um, and it's actually destroyed the entire country's economy. So it's not just about the loss of life, it's also about the wider impact that these events can have. Again, some more examples of uh, societal risks. Um, it's a occurrence of multiple fatalities in a single event. It's where exposure of vulnerable groups, for example, children to risk, Fairgrounds is a good example, and I'll show you an example later of that, um, where people do tend to get concerned on a, on a more um, broad front. And one of the great societal risks, obviously, is explosions, um, especially in and around places like oil refineries, but also at just ordinary establishments that maybe have gas canisters, gas tanks, that type of thing. In terms of explosion, if you look at the hazard, the principal hazard comes from blast. Now, it can be two main types of explosion, a vapour cloud explosion, a VCE, or a blevy. Wonderful name, that. It means boiling liquid expanding vapour explosion. But just to give you a little bit of a feel for the types of damage that these things can have, if you have an overpressure created by a, an explosion, two pounds per square inch will bring down a brick wall. Two pounds per square inch. Your car tyres are at 32. Your bike tyres are at around about 70. If you're exposed to a 10 pounds per square inch blast, it's fatal, you'll die. It's quite simple. At 6.3 pounds per square inch, your eardrums will rupture. Again, it's well documented. Again, missiles coming from blast areas, small missiles, I'm talking here about nuts, bolts, small nuts and bolts, traveling at 200 miles an hour, it's likely to be fatal depending on where it actually hits you. 
equally heat. If you're exposed to 182 degrees um, uh, Celsius, you'll get irreversible lung injury in 30 seconds. And you'll find it difficult to breathe at just 127 Celsius. These are quite sobering points. Um, you would never have thought perhaps that two PSI was enough to bring your house down. But that, in effect, is the truth. So a lot of time and effort is taken to regulate the potential areas where such blasts can occur. I'm, I'm going to show you uh, a little video here. And it's, it's involving a, a gas storage tank. And um, it's been impinged upon by a jet flame. About 10% of all refinery incidents involve jet flame impingement on storage vessels. And here we can see the flame actually starting to heat the, the vessel. That's a safety valve lifting. In doing so, it's cooling the, temp the temperature of the, the cylinder and it's also reducing the amount of material in there. You wouldn't stand within a couple of hundred yards of that, incidentally, the heat's so intense. You'll see it lifting again shortly, but as, as it goes on, you'll find that the amount of liquid in the tank starts to drop. And here you can see that happening. Now, as the liquid drops below the point at which the flame impingement happens, the metal starts to heat up dramatically and you get a type of failure that's due to a phenomenon called mechanical creep. So once it's playing in bare metal, the destruction of the tank is inevitable. You're going to see an explosion and it's going to be about a quarter tonne of uh, LPG. I don't quite know whether it's propane or butane, to be honest with you. But have a look at this. It's in slow motion to start with. Pretty dramatic stuff and you wouldn't like to be anywhere near that is quite dramatic. That's a quarter ton of LPG. You get these cylinders throughout towns. You get them in rural areas, hotels, everywhere else. Have a look again. Just watch carefully here and watch what's happening on the right hand side of the screen. There we see it. There's a blast. Look at the right hand side there. We talked about missiles earlier on. There's the entire end cap of the tank blowing. That is what then causes huge amounts of disaster. Here it is in real time. Absolutely devastating explosions. Absolutely devastating. And anywhere near that, you would just get fried. It's huge amounts of radiated energy comes from the air. Okay, moving on. We had such an incident not so long ago at Bunsfield, um, the 29 tonnes of TNT equivalent from a vapour cloud explosion. And do bear in mind that a vapour cloud explosion is the same as a fuel air bomb. It's about the second most powerful device after a nuclear weapon and with 29 tonnes of TNT. Smoke seen from 70 odd miles and apparently audible across the channel 120 miles away. Walls were destroyed, remember we talked about the two PSI, <coughs> 0.5 of a mile away, whilst windows were broken five miles away. Fortunately, only 43 people were injured simply because it was a weekend and the people in the office were not present. There's a little bit of a, a picture giving you the dramatic effects. Um, anyone caught anywhere near that smoke is clearly not going to live. And again, it's one of the issues that we look at particularly uh, closely about gas clouds. Um, again, focusing on societal risk, toxic gas clouds. Bhopal is the one that stands out there. 2,259, that was official figures, died from metal isocyanate poisoning, um, both public and employees. The actual figure is probably nearly 8,000. Children were especially affected. And the reason for that is that metal isocyanate is dense. It sits again the ground. And all people needed to do was go to a high area and they probably wouldn't have been affected. Children being nearer to the ground suffered disproportionately. Um, so what is tolerable risk? Um, well, for employees, the, the, the absolute limit is one in a thousand. One chance is an annualised risk, one chance of death in a thousand years. The upper limit for employees is one in a hundred thousand per year. For non-employees, it's an order, an order of magnitude bigger, and you're looking at one in 10,000 and one in a million. So above one in a million, we don't get particularly concerned. That translates roughly to your chances of being struck by lightning. But it's sometimes difficult to get your, your mind around these large numbers. What does it actually mean? Well, have a look at this slide. I'll not dwell on it too long. 
But um, this looks at UK national mortality statistics, I think the year's 2015, um, and it's an annual risk of death. Any person, if you take somebody at random um, from the, some society, they've got a one chance in 136 of dying of any one year. If you break that down into age groups, you can see that it varies quite dramatically. So from ages uh, 1 to 14, you're looking at 1 in 4,000 chance of dying, 1 in 8,000 chance of dying. If you look at the women, on the other hand, you'll see that their chances of dying are much lower than those of males. And we'll come on to talk about that very briefly for one second. So when we're talking about one in 10,000, we are talking about incredibly high standards. We expect employers to go to pretty extreme lengths to make sure that their employees are not hurt in any shape we are form. And um, when you look at the age groups there, you start to see the large divergence between male and female between 15 and 34. Why is this? I'm not overly sure, but I suspect um, this might be part of the reason. You frequently find men doing particularly strange things, certainly at work. And um, I suspect that um, this chap was probably quite lucky to come back alive. How do we enforce then? So we've got this idea of risk, we've got, unaccept we've got acceptable and unacceptable risk. So moving on to how does HSE enforce? Well, what we have is what's called the enforcement management model. How does HAC decide an appropriate action? Now remember that could be verbal, it could be a letter, it could be an improvement notice, a prohibition notice, or indeed a prosecution. Um, the EMM really does put all of the different key issues that need to be considered into the one system. But it is a framework. Inspectorial professional judgment is still essential to make sure that it works properly. The basis of it, as we talked at the very beginning of this talk, was the risk gap. What's the actual risk? What's the benchmark risk? And that gives you what's known as the initial enforcement expectation. For the chap in the ladder there, that would be an extreme risk gap. The benchmark would be that he would have a proper scaffold with proper guardrails, toolboards, and what have you. But that doesn't always give you the full stuff. We can have guys that are completely irresponsible all the time. We can sometimes get people who are actually generally very good and sometimes make a, a mistake. For those people, what we do is, in fact, for everybody, we look at the accident history, the inspection history, and the enforcement history of that particular organisation. And we look at their general standards. And we look at their attitudes. It's also quite an important thing. We then put that back in to say, well, this actually, this guy's fairly good, and this looks like a bit of an aberration, um, in which case we might reduce the amount of action we might take, so it might move from a prosecution to an improvement notice. That's only one point. So then we have to consider strategic factors, public interest, protection of vulnerable groups. Will the action result in sustained compliance? So, for example, where we've got a fatality, that's considered to be an aggravating factor, and in most cases, assuming that the evidence is the uh, action will be taken. <clears throat> um, moving on to a fair ground accident, and this is a good example of societal risk, frequently it's children. And here's a press release. In one incident in Shepherd's Bush Green, West London, on Saturday evening, a car from a fairground ride plunged to the ground, killing two of its three occupants. Here's the actual ride involved. Um, and believe it or not, for the trial, it was a manslaughter trial, in fact, um, that entire ride was brought into the bowels, if you like, of the old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court. That's not a particularly good photograph. And here's what it would look like normally. Now, you see the attachment point at the top of the seat, just going on to what looks like an umbrella. That is the part that failed, um, causing the two people to well, just come straight off the area. They were both Australian nationals. And uh, it was pretty traumatic for the family having to come over. All these things are pretty traumatic. And it's something I would never wish on any employer. But it does happen. And it means that you do need to make sure that you comply fully with all of the guidance and law that's available. Um, as I said, the cause, a safety critical coupling linking the car to the arm of the recently inspected ride failed. The coupling was not examined. That is a pretty key area and the HSE guidance, which in fact I actually wrote in conjunction with uh, industry, it meant that the initial enforcement expectation for that was an extreme risk gap. The benchmark standard that we used to measure against was HSE in industry guidance. 
And as soon as that happened, the HSE and police began an investigation. It's a work-related death protocol, and Kamal will be talking about that slightly later. But one of the things I can say about this is that where we get such a high-profile type um, event, the HSE is virtually guaranteed to throw limited, unlimited resource at these investigations. And it's amazing what can be done. When we look to the duty holding factors, we, we very frequently, uh, quickly came into the, um, the fact that it was the right examiner. Um, so when we looked at his duty holder factors, we found that he did have an enforcement history against him. He had also, and this is a cardinal sin in, in any which way you look at it, he tried to gain economic advantage. And we were able to do that because he had performed something of the order of 300 alleged inspections in about a month's time. It simply wasn't possible. And um, the inspector's assessment at the time, he was well aware of all this. He had actually attended some of the in industry safety meetings where such examinations were talk talked about. So the indication, uh, indicated enforcement action was perhaps unsurprisingly um, prosecution. And from the strategic factor point, the public interest, um, and I ended up being the expert witness in that case, uh, ended up in the uh, witness box for about two days. Anyway, the outcome of all of this was a fear, and here's the press release from it, a fairground inspector who failed to spot defects in a fairground ride which flew apart, killing two friends, has been jailed from 18 months for manslaughter. The employed, and I've redacted his name, should have spotted the disastrous defects to the rusty super trooper ride the old Bailey held. Not actually quite true. I think the judge had missed a couple of bits. What the key issue was, was he hadn't removed some of the the plastic coverings to look at it. Had he done so, and it's a, it's a very commonly insisted upon action, you strip all the coverings off to look at the key parts. He would have easily spotted this. Anyone could have found it, to be honest with you. So again, unusual to get a, 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 a jail sentence, um, but 18 months, pr pretty, pretty severe sentence, but not when you consider the two people that lost their lives. Um, Again, that was looking more at a societal type risk. Moving on to a more common type uh, occupational health and safety matter, forklift trucks. Um, and here's one, uh, I think again, a, a press cutting following the death of David Westwater, uh, 22 of Denny, who had worked for Basil Pinckney, and this was a chap who owned this particular business, his Coatbridge scaffold refurbishment business for only two weeks before the accident in August 2012. Airdy Sheriff Court held that Mr Westwater was driving an unladen forklift truck down a slope when he made a sharp turn left, causing the vehicle to tip over. He was thrown to the ground and the vehicle's protective cage fell onto his head. He was pronounced dead at the scene. I was involved in that one. Um, and from my point of view, I'll talk you through some of the issues that I've that, that was going through my mind. I was initially sitting at my desk and the boss asked if I recall visited, visiting the site some years back. I do. Um, he tells me then that there's been a fatality. Inevitably, I start to feel rather uncomfortable. Have I done everything correctly? Have I done everything correctly in relation to HSE guidance on inspection? Um, I learned that it's a forklift truck incident. And then I realised that I had actually served a forklift truck improvement notice for training. And it turns out that the deceased had not been trained. And indeed, that was the early indications that there was no driver training whatsoever. There's an assumption made that it's like driving a car. It's not. It's got rear wheel steering. It's got a triangular wheel base. It's got a half ton counterbalance on the back. It's got a movable centre of gravity. There's a lot of different things that need to be taken into consideration when you're training someone for a forklift truck. My prior role was then considered, um, and it was considered sound. That meant that I can be part of the procurator fiscal, the, the prosecuting authorities in Scotland, led work-related death protocol investigation team, though I was not going to be front-facing. I have to say that I wondered what had happened. Um, Azul Pinkney was a really nice guy. He seemed to listen to me. Um, I was also quite concerned for him in some respects. He's not a limited company. It suddenly struck me that he may be in a great degree of difficulty. 
There was some talk of a Scottish offence, a common law offence of culpable reckless conduct, but that was quickly knocked in the head. Culpable homicide was also considered, but equally quickly knocked in the head. There was too much distance between the two issues to impart the recklessness implied. implied. The investigation um, was, as frequently the case, harrowing. I spoke to some of the witnesses and it included believe it or not, the deceased mother. She had witnessed her own son's death. I don't know how I could have coped with that, and I don't know how she coped with that. Not uncommon. Um, in fairground rides, I've come across a number of different uh, cases where parents have watched their children die. Um, so these things are devastatingly important, and I would urge any employer not to have such a thing and to take the appropriate precautions and follow the guidance and law. As for the incident, well, the risk gap is certainly extreme. There's an ACOP, an approved code of practice for forklift truck driving, extremely well known throughout industry um, and across industry, not just any single industry. The duty holder factors were against Mr Pinkney as well. We had previous enforcement action on the same topic. The strategic factors, clearly the death of a young 22-year-old man is in the public interest that appropriate action gets taken. So we did advise, as we always do, that the accused and the defendant in, um, in England and Wales, it's called the accused in Scotland, was advised at an early stage to get very good quality legal and technical advice. We always do that. This was a very serious allegations with potentially devastating outcomes, both for him as an individual and for his company. I was unaware at the time, but um, uh, he actually engaged HCR Law. Kamal was his lawyer. Good choice, I think so. Over to you, Kamal. Thank you. Okay, so in contrast to the approach taken by regulatory inspectors after a serious workplace incident, we as defence lawyers need to consider at the very outset what defences may be available and to a certain extent to predict the strength of the prosecution's evidence. So now let's consider and recap on a typical scenario that we face. So I've just been called by my client at 10.30 in the evening and they explained to me that they have suffered a fatality on their site. So after taking some brief details, I get to their site for around six o'clock the next morning and this is what I find. I find the health and safety executive on site, I find the police are on site, and I find that a number of workers are also milling around on the site itself. And in a corner, I see my clients, the director of the company, who's been questioned by police and the health and safety executive. So with that scenario in mind, let's break this down and consider what's going to happen next. Well, first and foremost, there, there will be an investigation and this will invoke what's called the Work-Related Deaths Protocol. The protocol sets out how regulators will work during criminal investigations of work-related deaths. Corporate manslaughter is committed by a company if the way its activities are managed, organised by senior management, causes a person's death, which amounts to a gross breach of duty of care, and that there has been a serious failure to comply with health and safety legislation and attitudes, policies, systems, or accepted practices are encouraged or produced tolerance of that failure. And of course, it's the police who investigate these serious crimes. The health and safety executive, on the other hand, investigate health and safety at work related breaches. And they'll look at the Health and Safety at Work Act and also the regulations that underpin the Act, such as the working at height, provision and use of work equipment regulations and the management of health and safety at work regulations. Ultimately, though, it's going to be the Crown Prosecution Service who will determine whether the police retain control of the investigation or whether the matter is actually handed over to the HSE to consider health and safety offences. In our scenario, Let's assume that the health and safety executive takes primacy and deals with the matter. The health and safety executive has wide ranging powers of investigation under section 20 subsection 2 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and they can investigate incidents involving the possibility of non-compliances with health and safety legislation. 
their powers are wide, wide ranging and they can gain access to premises at a reasonable time. They have the ability to take away articles for examination and investigation. They have powers to obtain documentary records such as risk assessments and safe systems of work and any CCTV footage. They also have the power to obtain evidence by the way of questioning and interviewing witnesses and suspects. Now on this point, it's important to understand what the different types of interview are. So first and foremost, there's what's un understood to be informal questioning at the time of an incident. So that's when the health and safety executive right at the start of an investigation will pull out of their um, handbook and start taking notes of people that they wish to interview at a later date and also may take some introductory uh, evidence and information from people who may be at the site in their vicinity. Now section 9 interviews are conducted in accordance with section 9 of the Criminal Justice Act and they are voluntary statements. This is in effect a witness statement which one would give voluntarily. People can choose to answer none, some or all of those questions and the interview can be terminated at any time because attendance is entirely voluntary. You can elect to have someone with you during the interview and that can include a lawyer. Section 20 statements conducted in accordance with Section 20 of the Health and Safety at Work Act is a more formal interview and one must answer the inspector's reasonable questions and failure to do so may in itself be an offence depending on the circumstances. However, a Section 20 statement cannot be used in a later prosecution against an individual making the statements, but can be used against the company. A person may opt for a Section 20 interview if they fear that they themselves may be vulnerable to allegations that they have committed an offence. It's an offence to intentionally obstruct an inspector. We would always suggest that legal advice is taken prior to attending any meeting with the regulator and to make sure that it's made clear to you by the regulator in what capacity you are being questioned. For example, are you being questioned as an individual or as a representative of a company? And indeed, are you being questioned under caution as a witness? And as this final bullet point here with regards to PACE interviews, if you are considered a suspect, you will be invited to an interview under caution. So what is a PACE interview? What is an interview under caution? Well, let's look at the caution itself. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. So breaking this down in, into its constituent parts, of course, you don't have to say anything at all. You can, you can have a no comment interview. An adverse inference, however, can be made if you seek to rely on a statement that you make in court, but you did not make at the interview itself. And with regards to anything you say may be given in evidence, nothing is off the record. You have the right to a solicitor to be present and we would always advise that you do have a solicitor at an interview in caution. But what are your options? Well, you can attend and answer questions put to you at an interview under caution. You can decline to attend um, a health and safety related interview under caution. And indeed, you can write a statement and prepare prepare and draft this based on questions that can be anticipated and submit that to the health and safety executive. Again, you would want to clarify if you're being questioned in your personal capacity or rather on behalf of the company that will affect how you approach uh, an interview under caution and especially if you're going to prepare a written statement. So going back to our scenario, what, what are our defence considerations at this point? Well, Let's assume that the health and safety executive has concluded its investigation. This could be between one to three years post incident. Indeed, I've had matters where an incident has happened and it hasn't been prosecuted until six years after the event. The health and safety executive may seek to prosecute. And in this instance, let's assume that the limited company and the director of my client's company are prosecuted. And also note that because this is a a fatality in our scenario, an inquest may have already taken place. So before I start thinking about plea, I need to consider the prosecution papers and consider whether I challenge aspects of the investigation and the evidence that's been gathered by the health and safety executive to date. But how would I do this? Well, I'd need to take extensive witness statements from the company, including any witnesses 
um, who were there on the day of the incident, or indeed who may be able to give decent and useful background information about the company and the way it operates its activities. I would also need to consider at the outset if I need to obtain experts' evidence, so for example, engineering or forensic evidence that may assist our defence going forwards. And then I also need to consider evidence that may have been heard at the inquest. Evidence heard at an inquest, of course, cannot be regurgitated in any other future proceedings, but of course there may be lines of inquiry which I need to follow up following from um, evidence heard at any inquest. So necessarily a successful defence takes significant time to prepare. We will require significant amounts of management time and access to document systems and personnel. And it can be very difficult to demonstrate innocence beyond reasonable doubt. But of course, when things go very wrong, the inevitable question that I am asked by my clients is, what's the likely outcome if we are found guilty or if we plead guilty to a health and safety offence? Well, of course, each case is different and each case will turn on its own merits. But to answer at least one aspect of that question, we need to consult the 2016 sentencing guidelines for health and safety, corporate manslaughter and food safety and hygiene offences. And we also need to consult the 2018 guidelines, which was issued to judges, which increased effectively prison sentences for people convicted of gross negligence manslaughter in a workplace setting. So concentrating for the moment on the 2016 sentencing guidelines, these are guidelines which introduced a codified system for fines and it, the starting point for fines is now based on turnover. Now this saw when it was introduced a dramatic increase in fines since the guidelines have been introduced. Pre-2016 guidelines, a good day in court would be a fine of less than 150 to 200,000 pounds. Now, if we were to go to court on a fatality, that's likely to be a starting point for uh, a small or medium-sized company, and it can indeed go to, into the high hundred thousand pounds, going into millions of pounds for those very large companies who have been found guilty of health and safety breaches. There has been a lower threshold for custodial sentences for individuals introduced by the sentencing guidelines, and crucially, the sentencing guidelines themselves apply to health and safety offences, corporate manslaughter offences and food safety offences. The 2016 guidelines provide a nine-step process to assist the court to determine how a corporate defendant ought to be sentenced. The first three stages are seen as the most significant steps which are highlighted on my slide and where the majority of the focus is placed during sentencing. The next stages can be taken into account depending on the circumstances of the case. So the first step requires consideration of two factors, culpability and harm. Now sticking with step 1a, culpability, culpability ranges from very high, a deliberate breach or a flagrant disregard of the law, to low, which is where the failings were minor and occurred as an isolated incident, or the offender didn't did not fall far short of the appropriate standard. In our experience, it's rare for a case to be pitched as low by a prosecutor. With regards to step 1b, harm, a harm category is determined by the risk of harm created by the offence, taking into account the seriousness of the harm breached, such as death or a progressive permanent or irreversible condition, and the likelihood of that harm arising. And with regards to the sentencing guidelines, that's decided by a determination of low, medium or high likelihood of harm. In 2019, the Sentencing Council undertook an assessment of the impact and the implementation of the sentencing guidelines and found that in 81% of cases analysed, those sentencing mentioned both the seriousness of harm risked and the likelihood of harm, suggesting that both aspects of harm are being taken into account in the sentencing process. So then we move to step two and here we look at the focus on the organisation's annual turnover or equivalent to reach a starting point for the fine. So where an organisation's turnover is very greatly exceeds that of a large organisation, i.e. £50 million pounds, 
and over, the guideline states that it may be necessary to move outside of the suggested range to achieve a proportionate sentence. This has been a tricky issue to, de to determine, particularly as the guideline gives no further indication of what is, to, what is considered as very greatly exceeding the turnover and by what amount to move outside of the su that suggested range. In Whirlpool UK Appliances case, the court identified that there was no arithmetic approach to define the boundary between a large and very large organisation. We understand that a case where a £300 million turnover business has been determined to be very large is currently on leave um, to be appealed at the Court of Appeal. Aggravating factors and mitigating features are also considered at this stage. It's useful to note that the companies um, up to £2 million are considered to be micro companies. Those between a turnover of £2 million and £10 million are considered to be small and medium range companies are those between 10 million pounds and 50 million pounds in turnover. So turning to aggravating factors, common aggravating factors, factors cited by the health and safety executive include looking at any previous convictions, cost cutting at the expense of safety, a poor health and safety record and the targeting of vulnerable victims. Contrasting that with mit common mitigating factors that I would seek to advance the defence lawyer in mitigation include no previous convictions or relevant convictions, voluntary steps have been taken to remedy the situation, and that the company or the individual themselves are of good character. Then we turn to step three, which deals with proportionality. The fine must reflect the seriousness of the offence, and a court must take into account the financial circumstances of the offender. Emphasis is placed on the fine being sufficiently substantial to have a real impact, which will bring home to both management and shareholders the need to comply with health and safety legislation. Note of caution though, in recent cases involving a organisation in the healthcare industry, the sentencing judge noted that the defendants or the defendant organisation group had a substantial turnover and accordingly increase the fine to reflect their economic realities. On appeal, the Court of Appeal determined that the phrase economic realities in a sentencing guideline could not be extended to mean that the parent's resources belong to the subsidiary simply in order to justify a large increase in fine at step three, unless, of course, there was some special factor present. So the court now looks at the financial circumstances of the offender in the round. This does not necessarily mean that the fine should be adjusted upwards. It can also be adjusted downwards where the turnover of the organisation is high, but profit in fact is low. So now we turn to the 2018 Gross Negligence Manslaughter Sentencing Guidelines. These guidelines, as, as mentioned previously, were issued to judges to increase prison sentences for people convicted of gross negligence manslaughter in a workplace setting. So to put this into context, oftentimes in health and safety matters where there has been a fatality and when the corporate entity is charged with a breach of health and safety law, its directors can also be charged in the section 37 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. In very serious cases, individuals and directors can be charged and prosecuted by the CPS for manslaughter by gross negligence. The offence of gross negligence manslaughter is committed where the death is the result of a grossly negligent, though otherwise lawful, act of remission on the part of the defendant. This offence was excluded from the 2016 guidelines, and we can now see that it's the sentencing council's intention that for workplace cases, it will also be punished more severely than before. The new guidelines were published by the sentencing council and mark the first time that a comprehensive direction has been drawn up for the most serious and most difficult cases of manslaughter. Under the guidelines, anyone convicted of manslaughter by gross negligence could face a prison sentence of up to 18 years. So for a typical workplace case of gross negligence manslaughter, the 2018 guidelines means that the starting points with regards to sentencing will be four years imprisonment with a range of three to seven years, depending on other factors. 
there are four levels of culpability from low to very high, each of which leads to a different starting point um, with regards to jail term. The starting points are 12 years, eight years, four years, and two years for culpabilities of very high, high, medium, and low, respectively. Other factors can then be taken into account to move you down a little or up a lot with a specified range around each starting point. For example, the very high range is a range between 10 to 18 years, and you move up the range, for example, if more than one person was put at risk or you ignored previous warnings. But, there has, but where there has been a blatant disregard for a very high risk of death, and or motivation to avoid costs, then a starting point would be eight years or even 12 years with a range up to 18 years. That's substantially more than in the past for these more serious cases. So finally, from a defence lawyer's perspective, the message for the boardroom is clear. Senior executives need to be aware of the behaviours that can get them into significant issues. They should proactively lead an agenda of compliance. Furthermore, these guidelines can be harnessed as a tool to train directors and senior executives as the importance of setting the right tone is clear as an important step and a proactive step to be taken right at the top of an organisation. Of course, accidents do happen, but the real test in these situations is whether you are able to produce a compelling defence. Thanks, Kamal. Uh, that was really enlightening. I will now look at this actually all means the cost of getting it wrong and as you'll appreciate there are three elements to this one is the financial aspect the other is custodial and finally uh, reputation so taking financial first uh, the important thing to say is the courts continue to look at sentencing on an individual basis irrespective of the tough trading conditions that many businesses encountered over the past 18 months. It's fair to say that some businesses did a good deal better than others. So as a consequence, we are still seeing eye-watering fines, and, and by that I mean six, seven figure fines that have been imposed. In other instances, perhaps where the company hasn't uh, done as well, uh, fines seem to be relatively light when compared to the severity of the consequences brought about by the breach that occurred. There's no doubt in relation to custody that this is uh, a sentence that is being used more and more, and in a moment I'll, I'll demonstrate why that is. Um, it's clear uh, that certainly courts are looking at individual culpability in any event a lot closer than perhaps they have done historically. The Health and Safety's Enforcement Policy Statement makes it very clear that where an incident occurs, the courts must not only look at corporate culpability, but, but also individual culpability. Indeed, very recently, the Westminster Magistrates Court imposed a 26-week prison sentence on a director who failed to file a riddle report in the time required. It was an extreme case, but nevertheless, it goes to show just how seriously these things are being considered. Reputationally, obviously cases where prison sentences are imposed or large financial fines generally attract a lot of media attention. And that will have an impact on the view of companies that may wish to deal with you or customers who buy your goods. A conviction is a stain on the company's criminal record. 
I also want to mention that where an enforcement notice, albeit an improvement notice or a prohibition notice has been issued, that will be a permanent stain on the company's criminal record. It's there to stay. Therefore, if you do receive an improvement notice or an enforcement notice, it's really important to look at whether or not there are grounds for an appeal. And if there are, you have 21 days effectively to lodge your appeal with an employment tribunal. So we now come on to look at trends in prosecution, sentencing and fines. You'll see that the trend is a downward one, which is great. Um, you need to think about, well, why is that? Um, and is it because you know, health and safety is being taken so much more seriously by organizations? I definitely think that is true, although as in all these things, there's room for improvement. I also think that uh, the, uh, the HSE is under pressure uh, through lack of resources and therefore doesn't have the capacity to be able to uh, bring these prosecution in, in the numbers that perhaps they have historically. Uh, this is largely being brought about by a lack of resources generally, including uh, the advent of the Building Standards Regulator. Apparently the Building Standards Regulator uh, is offering inspectors a much better salary package, uh, which has proved very tempting. So I think what we're finding is that firstly, and very frustratingly, is that investigations are taking much longer these days to determine whether or not enforcement action uh, will be taken. I've seen several cases which on the facts do not appear complicated and where there appears to be little defense and these have been taking over four years to get to a disposal hearing. The problem for duty holders is that they have this stressful event hanging over them for a very long time. And of course, in that time, things change, important documents can get lost, people move on, uh, and, and so uh, it becomes even more difficult uh, to, to contest any allegations which are, being, which are being made. In addition, I think the health and safety executive has been cherry picking. In other words, picking the easier cases to prosecute. There's also been greater use of alternative solutions, albeit cautions, the issue of notices of contravention and the use of the fee for intervention scheme. But really interesting, as I said at the very outset, is this how close the blue line conviction is to the, the orange line uh, cases brought, 95%. Why are they so successful? Well, the reason they're so successful is the, the use of Section 40 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, which in effect reverses the burden of proof. So it's not for the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a duty holder breached the duty. All the prosecution has to do is demonstrate that the work activity that is investigated created a risk. And once that risk has been established, the burden changes and it becomes incumbent on the duty holder to demonstrate that it did everything reasonably practicable to control that risk. And as you know and will appreciate, that is a very difficult thing to be able to do, hence the reason why it's the, the HSE have been so successful. Now, I suppose the question coming from that is, has the time come in light of the significant fines being imposed and custodial sentences to actually review the application of section 40 to bring it more into line with the rest of the criminal justice system. 
where the burden of proof falls fairly and squarely on the on the prosecution. It's certainly something to think about because where we are today is far removed from where we were in 1974 when this section came into being, where fines are considerably less than they are now. And it wasn't an option for the court to be able to introduce custodial sentences. We'll also look at the trends so far as fines are concerned, and you can see that they have been uh, on the decline since its peak in 2017-18. Having said that, I think given the number of cases that are currently being prosecuted, the fines actually still remain comparatively high. And as I said before, the courts aren't shirking from imposing significant six-figure and in some cases, seven-figure fines. And the situation in regard to custodial sentences is also very significant. You'll see from the pie charts that last year, 2019-20, 22% of sentences that were imposed were custodial. And that is up 10% from the previous year. So a fifth, over a fifth of every sentence that is imposed is custodial. So it really does go to demonstrate uh, how closely the HSE is now looking at individual culpability and why individuals must be very careful to ensure they do all they can to ensure good compliance. And as the slide says, you definitely want to avoid this. I won't go into each individual case, but it's very clear that some very significant fines were imposed and in some of the cases, custodial sentences as well. Well, there's one particular case, which is a bit of a favorite of mine. It's Harlow District Council and G4S, which I think is a really good example of where the HSE investigate for one reason and prosecute on the basis of another. This was a case where an employee of G4S contracted Legionella. It was suspected that he contracted Legionella from his workplace. So the HSE went in, did a thorough investigation, but couldn't actually make any causal connection between the disease and the workplace. However, during the course of the investigation, they noted that there were some serious issues with the G4S's safety management systems to the extent they found that they could give a risk to someone contracting Legionella. And so they prosecuted on that basis. As a result, G4S were fined two million pounds. A really good example of just how careful you need to be. Remember, a health and safety executive inspector can come onto your premises at any time. You need to make sure that your systems are operating as effectively as they need to be. Because whilst he may come in to do a spot check, say in relation to COVID compliance, he may then find other work activities which cause him concern, make him feel that there's a real risk that someone could be injured as a result of that activity and lead to the issue of an enforcement notice and even perhaps a prosecution. But really important that insofar as it is possible, a visit by a health 
and safety inspector is properly managed. I do hope that's been thought provoking. And I'm sure you may well have a number of questions that we will be very happy to deal with.